Hello, and welcome to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest institution in the United States devoted to arts, science, and the artistry of movie making. Thank you for coming. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the water and land on which we program, curate, convene, and discuss. We honor and respect Tongva ancestors and the Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, activism, art, and education. We also acknowledge their continued work to safeguard resources. My name is Eduardo Sanchez. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at the museum. Thank you for joining us in our wonderful David Geffen Theater. Today, we're gonna to be experiencing our Documentary Shorts nominees panel, presented as part of our Oscars Week programming. Before we begin the panel, please, <clears throat> before we begin the panel, public programming for, uh, for 2023 Oscars Week is made possible by the Ruderman Family Foundation, which promotes authentic representation in the entertainment industry and full inclusion of people with disabilities throughout all sectors of society. I would like to thank our ASL interpreters who will be assisting us today, Richard Loya and Ajamu Brown. Please help me in welcoming to the stage Senior Vice President of Members Relations, Global Outreach and Awards Administration, Tom Oyer. Hello everyone, nice to see you all. Thank you all for coming as we celebrate our uh, documentary short film nominees today. I'm here representing our member relations and awards administration team. And as you know, we, as, as we're here to celebrate the documentary short film nominees, I feel like I need to tell you how we got here. How did we end up with our nominees that we have today? Uh, the way it works is it's a few steps in the process. The first step is the films need to qualify. There's a couple different ways by which documentary short films can qualify for Academy consideration. The first step is by doing a one week theatrical run to qualify. The second step is by uh, winning a qualifying festival award. We have a number of qualifying festivals on our list that uh, films that win those specific juried awards are automatically eligible to submit for consideration. And the third way is by a film winning a one of the medals at the Student Academy Awards. Throughout those methods, uh, the films qualify. The next step of the process is the films need to submit for consideration. Uh, they submit their, pro submit their film through our process for the Academy, and I wanna give a special thank you to Michael Benedict, Lauren McPhee, and many others on the Academy team who oversee the submissions process, and without all the work they do year round to get to this point, it this category would not be possible. Uh, the next step, of course, in the process is the voting. So from there with the voting, we work with the doc members of the documentary branch of the Academy. It's approximately 650 members worldwide uh, that are, work as both directors, producers, editors, et cetera, that are focused in nonfiction. Those members are the ones that view the films throughout the year as the films are submitted on our Academy screening room and at screenings, et cetera. From that process, the, each of the members then vote to determine a shortlist. That round of voting is in December, comes up with our short list of 15 films. From there then, again, the members of the documentary branch will then vote in January to determine the five nominees that you have here today. The next step, of course, is then the entire Academy membership is our then vote on all 23 categories. The entire Academy membership votes to determine the winners, which ended on Tuesday. So that is done, voting is over. We will find out on Sunday what, what the end result will be. Um, I want to take a moment to really thank all the members of the Academy that we work with year-round and all the viewing <laughs> that they participate in. It's very much appreciated, uh, and we will continue to enlist your help all the time. <laughs> um, next, um, I, next is my pleasure is to introduce you three wonderful members of the documentary community who I have the pleasure of working with all year round, not just during Oscar season. Uh, these are the three documentary branch governors, Kate Amend, Chris Hedges, and Jean Shen. Good afternoon. I just want to thank Tom Oyer for every day he works so hard for our documentary branch and also Michael Benedict. Without you guys, we don't know what to do. <laughs> it is my honor to introduce our newest governor, Chris Hedges. And this year makes three editors for the documentary branch governors. Chris. Thank you, Jean. Um, Welcome everyone, I'm just so happy to be here. I'm probably the oldest filmmaker in the branch, but the 
uh, youngest of newest uh, governor, and it's my pleasure to serve this institution. And uh, I love being with my fellow governors, Madam Governors here, and um, they've taught me so much already, especially Kate, uh, who after nine years is going to be leaving us, and we're very sad about that, but thank you, Kate, for all your guidance. Thank you, Chris and Jean and Tom and Michael. And this is such a wonderful day, week, for all the filmmakers. You know, as, a, as an editor, I have worked on short films, and I think the, sh the short film is a very unique and distinct art form. And in some ways, I think it's more challenging sometimes to tell a concise, impactful story in a short time frame. And the people you're going to be hearing from today have all done extraordinary work. I think their films are magnificent, they're powerful, resonant. Um, I've seen them many times. They're, they're s such beautiful films, and I assume you are here watching them or you have seen them. Um, but these are true artists that are you're going to be hearing from today. So with that, let me introduce our wonderful uh, museum exhibitions curator, Jenny He, who will be today's moderator. Thank you so much, Kate, Jean, and Chris. Um, really lovely to be here today. Hello, and welcome to Oscar Week at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. And welcome to the Documentary Short Film Nominees Panel. This is the first year that we are presenting Oscar Week here at the museum, and we're super excited. What a perfect venue to celebrate everything Oscars and all of our nominees who are here with us today. Uh, I'm Jenny He, exhibitions curator here at the museum, and specifically curator for many of our galleries in our core exhibition, Stories of Cinema. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to visit our galleries and exhibitions, and especially our Impact Reflection Gallery on the second floor, which highlights film's capacity to shape public awareness and to uh, create social change. Fittingly, many of the films that are featured in Impact Reflection are documentary features and shorts. And for their support um, of the museum's exhibitions, programs, numerous other initiatives, and in particular for helping to orchestrate Oscar Week here at the museum, I would like to first thank Academy President Janet Yang, the Academy CEO, Bill Kramer, the Academy Museum's President and Director, Jacqueline Stewart, our Chief Audience Officer, Amy Homa, and I would also love to thank uh, Eduardo Sanchez, Silver Feldman, and Tom Oyer. Thank you all for your tireless efforts and dedication in making this incredible week of celebrations happen. Uh, we are so thrilled to have all of our Academy Award nominees here, and we're so thrilled to celebrate them here at Oscar Week at the museum. Before I invite our nominees on stage, uh, I would like to ask our ASL interpreter to please uh, take their seat. And now, please allow me to introduce our nominees for Best Documentary Short Film. For Stranger at the Gate, Joshua Seftel and Connell Jones. For the Martha Mitchell Effect, Anne Alvarez and Beth Levison. For How Do You Measure a Year, Jay Rosenblatt. For Hall Out, Evgenia Arbugeva and Maxim Arbugeyev.
And for the elephant whisperers, Kartiki Gonzalez and Gunit Monga. Well, thank you everyone for being here with us today. This is so exciting. I can't wait to jump in and uh, talk about your films. So first, I think uh, for just a question I would love to pose to the group, um, and this is for everyone. This is a really an opening question about how did you come upon or discover the subject of your films? Really, you know, in other words, what inspired the idea for your respective movies? Um, so I would invite uh, to start off um, with a Stranger at the Gate. So thank you, everybody, for being here. It's very exciting to be here at the Academy Museum. And uh, I'll say that we, we started, um, we found this story in a, in a newspaper article. And we thought, oh my god, how can this be real? And we went and we reported on it, and we found the people. And we were just blown away by this idea that this kind of crazy guy who was mixed up and wanted to become, was almost a domestic terrorist, was able to change. And we were so inspired by that because, because of the times we live in right now. And uh, we just felt like we need stories like this uh, right now. And so we leaned into it and we went to Muncie and um, got to film with Bibi and Saber and and they took care of us and cooked for our crew and um, made sure we were had a great time in Muncie. And it was a, an am amazing experience to get to know those people. And every time I um, watch a film, especially documentary films, I think the first question for me is always, yes, exactly. How did you come upon this idea? And, and Jay, later on. I'm sure your, uh, your answer will be very specific. Um, but Anne and Beth, I would love to hear about the Martha Mitchell effect and, and really what inspired you to tell the story um, now. Yeah, so um, my co-director and I, Deborah McClutchy, um, came up with the idea together. We, um, it wasn't that novel an idea. Originally, it was we had heard it, um, uh, heard about Martha from a Slow Burn podcast, um, the first episode. and. We couldn't believe that we, neither of us, had heard of her. Um, she'd been completely glossed over in history. Um, we only knew about all the president's men. Um, and the more that we dug into you know, the archive just online, we realized that she was this kind of amazing, telegenic, charismatic character and was really sort of a pioneer. And that the reason we hadn't heard about her was because there had been a systematic uh, gaslighting campaign against her, um, sort of catalyzed by the Nixon administration. And we realized that was sort of the larger story. And the more that we dug into the White House tapes, the more we found evidence of that. And you know, the, the parallels were sort of uncanny with what was going on um, today. Um, and it's sort of like the gift that keeps on giving um, with January 6th and the you know multiple impeachments. So. Um, we just wanted to highlight and sort of exhume this, this um, heroine, this complicated heroine uh, for today's audience, someone who was brave enough to cross party lines and speak truth to power. Yes, and fascinating that the Martha Mitchell effect is an actual term and, and really bringing that story to the forefront. Um, thank you. And, and Jay, this is, well, I suppose, what inspired you to um, make this film. I, I, I won't ask you how did you come upon the subject of your film. Um, yeah, there was no accident in coming upon the subject. <laughs> this is about uh, our daughter, and um, actually we celebrated her birthday yesterday. She's, oh, wow. And, you know, this film is all about birthdays, her birthdays, so she's 22 now. And... Um, you know, when she was born, uh, it was, parenting was uh, obviously the priority, but also I've been a filmmaker for a long time, and I figured, how, how can I do both? So I made this film when she was born till maybe 16 months old, called I Used to Be a Filmmaker, and that was the beginning of making films with her, and we made 
four films until she was age five. Then I stopped because she was really developing a personality and I didn't want it to influence her, her privacy or change her in a way. But we continued with this other idea, which is how do you measure a year, which became how do you measure a year, where I would film her from age two until 18 on her birthday, uh, asking her similar questions, some same, sometimes adding something. And, um, but I didn't know I was necessarily making a film that would be released. I just knew that at the very least, we'd have this footage for her to have, you know, a, a, a record. And when COVID hit, I looked at the footage and I thought, yeah, I think there's a film here. So I hadn't looked at the footage at all from year to year. And uh, then the, you know, the rest is Oscar history. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jay. And Afghania and Maxim, I would love to hear about how you came upon the story for Hall Out. Yeah, we were working, so, well, first of all, we are from the same region, um, from Yakutia, we're from Eastern Siberia. And um, we were following um, a community of indigenous Chukchi people who are still living off the land and the sea and for a couple of years. And we didn't know actually about Hall Out, um, uh, strangely, even though it's like the biggest gathering of walruses on the planet, which, is, which was just 15 kilometers from the village where we were. And um, when hunters brought us there first time, and it was empty. We did, and they just said that there is thousands of walruses holding out here every year, and in this little hut there is uh, this lonely scientist um, living and studying them. And we just thought that this couldn't be true. Like it didn't seem like it could possibly be. And uh, next year we came back and we saw it, and uh, we were completely overwhelmed by 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 what we saw. And we came back to make a film. Yeah. Yeah, and just want to add that we spent a whole season with the scientists in Italy, and it took us three and a half months. So we stayed on the field for that time, uh, observing his work and the whole out. Wonderful, thank you. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Kartiki and Gunit, uh, we'd love to hear about how you came upon uh, the subject of your film. This is actually uh, in a place that I call home. And I was driving one day from Uti to Bangalore in the south of India to pack my things and shift back home. And that's when I saw this little elephant calf that was just three months old walking on the side of this road with this, with this man called Bowman. And I leaned out of the car and I shouldn't have been doing that. But I was so happy to see such a young calf and so excited. So, And after that, Bowman sort of he beckoned to me, so I pulled my car over to the left and jumped out, and I went and joined them. We went down to the river, and Raghu ran in full speed into the water, started splashing around, throwing his trunk in all directions. And at that point, I, it just really struck me that you had this unusual bond between, between this tiny little calf, who is a wild animal, and with this human being. So that made me to sort of explore deeper into the background of the subject. And that's when I realized that the Asian elephants are endangered and there are only about 35,000 to 40,000 of them left. And that made me really want to, to portray this beautiful family bond that I was experiencing. And I wanted to showcase to the world that, uh, that there's, all this, there's all this love and I wanted to help protect the elephants and also help that translate to other species across the world. And that's how this story came into being. Thank you, yeah. And I would love to dive, thank you everyone for, for that answer, those answers, and I'd love to dive deeper into each of your films. Um, for The Elephant Whisperers, it's a movie about two caretakers and an orphaned elephant, as, as you just mentioned. Um, and talking about that bond between animal and human, while you were making this film, we, we certainly can see it on screen, but were there any moments that surprised you just to see this close bond and? and how uh, Ragu and Bauman and, and Belly interacted together. The entire thing was just really special. I think when you're out in the middle of the wilderness just filming out in the middle of the forest, that itself is very special, and there's nothing that you can sort of preempt before. So every moment was surprising, and just living with the elephants and, and experiencing the special bond 
and watching the entire ecosystem r happen in front of your eyes. So, yeah. I think uh, definitely um, over the year, I mean, I, uh, and, and Kartiki puts it, you know, like when Belly does ask Amo to lay down, and she does, and it's almost like a surprise. So there were many moments like that where the elephants reacted and, you know, have uh, reciprocated love like, like human babies. So it's been, a, I think, a lot of awe-worthy moments for even the crew, and, and we hope we were able to capture and translate some of those. And it's also a love story, the elephant whispers. And at what point did you decide to add that element, or was that always part of your plan in the beginning to tell this love story between the two caretakers? It actually sort of unraveled as the documentary was happening because you would see all these cute moments of them together. And and Bowman and, and Belly have actually been living together for many years before this. And it was just a really special thing that unfolded over time. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, I was wondering that I was as I was watching the film. Thank you so much. Um, and to uh, move to a haul out. So in your story, uh, we follow a solitary man in Siberia um, in the remote region. And, and you mentioned, of course, that this area is familiar to you. Can you talk a little bit more about this area and what it was like to actually film there? It's a very special place. Actually, that, that beach where um, walruses haul out, it's also been a, a former settlement of, of uh, Chukchi people um, a, a century ago. So we uh, we still were finding these artifacts from from um, uh, from from that time of like uh, arrows made of walrus tusks and um, tools, etc. It was really special, and you kind of feel this atmosphere that you know quite spiritually charged, and we tried to 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 show it in the film um, a bit, like you know, give space to the elements, to the sea, to the roughness of of, of landscape. It is a very <clears throat> um, rough place, and but for us, because we're from <laughs> from the most northern place you can possibly be, probably like you look on the map and it's like on the edge of of the world, literally. Um, but there's so much beauty in this landscape. It's so subtle and so atmospheric, and we were just really trying to to capture that. And um, of course, there were some challenges, technical challenges, like you know, there was no electricity, of course, and we had to, you know, figure out how to charge the batteries, how to get water, and get you know, deliver the food with us, etc. But it was all, um, you know, we were following the scientists who's been doing it for years, for 10 years, so, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful film, and, and I loved how it's a broad region, but you were also to able to capture the intimacy, too, of the scientists um, living in, in that region. And, of course, the film talks about, or, you know, touches upon the ongoing impact of climate change. And it's illustrated in this movie. Um, and documentary film can be an effective tool for activism. How do you see that fitting into your practice, uh, specifically with this movie, the use of filmmaking for activism? There are so many, um, there are so many ways uh, we can tell stories of climate change. and, and um, we are just doing our bit from our part of the world, from our home home region, and of course, our story is quite heavy and sad. But I think you know it, it just shows the reality, and I think we need to know what is actually happening in the region. And um, we, um, since the film is uh, came out, we were just amazed by the amount of support that. Uh, the scientist received also, and now he is because of the film. He is now able to continue his research and um, and uh, found support for the programs that he he've he've been developing and dreaming about for years. So that I think for us that was the most important part of it all, just to see w the power of of the film and how actually you can see the tangible difference um, that impacts scientists' life. Of course. 
when we talk about animals and when we talk about ecosystems, unfortunately this, this process is irreversible and we need to understand that and we need to understand that we need to act to, so that it doesn't get worse and uh, we need to understand that it's all connected. These animals are migratory species. You know, one day they're in Siberia, the other season they're in Alaska. It's all connected. There's no borders for animals and we need to all come together as human beings, not just separate nationalities or separate countries. Yeah, and um, one of our goal was um, just do a kind of pure observation and uh, and then kind of let the audience decide in thinking about the climate change, about uh, what's happening now in the Arctic, re Arctic regions. Yes, it, it's uh, such a powerful message and, and of course film is powerful in so many ways. Narrative films certainly, but documentary films have such a special place in terms of grounding a story in real life and that um, impact, whether it's global or you know, a, a, a story that is very local. Um, it's amazing to see the range of stories here on stage with us today. And thank you so much, Evgenia and Maxim, uh, for, for talking about your film. And I love to move to uh, how do you measure a year, Jay, um, uh, speaking of intimacy. Um, so you mentioned you interviewed Ella um, every year on her birthday from age two to age 18. And I read that, of course, you didn't watch the footage um, until the, the last interview. So that would be accurate to say, right? Well, until two years after the last interview, till she was 20. Wow, and if you could go back, it was, is there a question, having seen the footage, that you wanted to ask Ella that you didn't? Yeah, you know, um, in the film, I actually say that I wasn't, uh, I think it was age 17, maybe 18, I said I, I actually wasn't thrilled with my questions when I reviewed everything, I, I thought I could have done better. Um, I'm not sure it, it mattered because I think it, the film is more, less about the answers to the specific questions and more about how she answers them, you know, and how she grows and how we see her in 29 minutes go from a two-year-old to a young woman. But that said, um, I was thinking I wish I had asked her something like, uh, what, wh what is God? I wish I asked her that question because I would have been interested to see how she processed that through the years uh, and, and get to maybe a more spiritual answer, maybe. Um, but, you know, since it started when she was two, it, I had to, uh, the questions had to be least understandable. So that might have been way too soon for, for a two-year-old. But, Maybe I could have added that question in as the years went on, but I kind of just got into a rhythm. And I did add a few questions, like I asked her how, how, what does she want to say to her 25-year-old self? And that was a hard concept for her at first, but she starts answering that more um, coherently as the film progresses. Uh, it's, uh, as a concept, of course, it's so, Great to see, as you mentioned, the evolution of the questions and, and how, um, as a person grows, you know, their answers change. And that power question that you know, really, really sticks with me. And just understanding, of course, uh, there, there's a moment where I, I suppose it was misinterpreted, but. Yes. Um, <laughs> but just thinking about how a two year old would answer that question versus, of course, um, an 18 year old. And you touched upon this in your answer to the first question, Jay, but thinking about parenting, your, your, your job as a parent and your job as a filmmaker, and on this movie, were there moments where these two different opposing uh, roles didn't line up for you as a parent and as a filmmaker? Um, I, I think they kind of lined up uh, in, 
most cases. Um, there were some surprise moments that um, as a filmmaker, I was very interested. As a parent, I was very surprised. Like, I asked her, um, what are you afraid of? I think it was age six or seven, and she says, you. And uh, as a filmmaker, I thought, well, that's interesting. As a parent, I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't totally line up there. Um, and then the power question that you brought up, um, I, I didn't realize that it was a misinterpretation until I was editing the film. Uh, so in fact, her answer to that question when she was three is probably the only thing that stayed with me in all the filming. And I thought, I, I, for, for years, I was thinking, why did she say that? <laughs> and then when I was editing it, it just, you know, and, and, and looking at the spelling of the word, it, it just clicked. Yeah, it was certainly a very precocious answer, if not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming people have seen the film, so. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Jay. Of course. So, uh, Anne and Beth, for the Martha Mitchell effect, um, you've already mentioned, of course, Martha Mitchell is a significant figure. She was the wife of um, Attorney General John Mitchell um, under Richard Nixon. And, you know, there's so much, um, you know, speaking to the relevance of this topic, we're, we're talking about representation of women in the media, we're talking about you know, a woman's quote unquote place in 1970s America. And I would love to hear a little bit about how these two structures in your view um, factor into the depiction of Martha um, as a villain at the time. Um, well, I think Martha was certainly a threat to the Nixon administration. Um, Early on, I think they appreciated her. She kind of brought attention in a positive way to the administration, and she was bright, and she was funny, and she was quick. Um, but then she really became extremely inconvenient once she started to know what was going on. So I think that we were really interested in looking at that power dynamic, um, the, the administration, this male administration vis-a-vis -vis Martha. And we were definitely interested in looking at the role of the press and how they shape the public's view of Martha. And um, you know, the administration certainly used the press to their advantage as much as they could. And she was also very good with the press as well. So I think we were interested in that relationship between um, an individual and power um, and the press. So there, 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 that was one triangle. And I think that Anne might um, speak to another. Yeah, I mean, I think when we, um, we knew that we could tell Martha's story, that it was very rich in those six years um, with the play-by-play, -play. but the real heart of the film is the love triangle that sort of emerged with, um, between Martha and Nixon sort of vying for the attention of John Mitchell. And in a lot of ways, it was also, you know, sort of a, a dissolution of a marriage. You know, it was very important for us to start with, like, what are, what's the fallout? What, is, what are the externalities of a political scandal? Because they were very much in love when they first um, entered Washington. And then by the end, they weren't, theoretically. Um, and you know, eventually, John Mitchell chose his boss over his wife. And when I think about this film, it's, I love listening to what everybody has to say about their films and how personal they are, for at least to the point that we've gotten to this far. And I think in many ways, Martha is, the Martha Mitchell effect is a historical film, but um, it was also very personal for us, sort of the personal is the political, and I think we all felt really, um, uh, like it was a form of almost activism for us to make this film, so, you know, I just want to acknowledge that we had an all-female team, um, I think they're over there, Deb, the co-director, Judith, producing partner, so... Yeah, just wanted to look at it through our female lens as well. Yeah, and um, speaking of uh, love between John Mitchell and Martha Mitchell, it was, it was really interesting to see that footage of John Mitchell actually talking about uh, Martha later on, you know, towards the end of the film. Um, and 
it's the, you use, of course, archi archival footage, um, primarily in, in, Mar in the film, The Martha Mitchell Effect. While you, between conceptualization of the film and as you're digging through the research and looking at this footage, were there any moments where you pivoted because of, of um, reviewing the archival footage? Pivoted in the storyline? Yes. Um, that's a great question. I mean, nothing that comes to mind. Um, I mean, there were certainly moments where, we, you know, we would come upon archival and we we're like, this is astounding. Like, we have to devote as much time as we can to it. Like, there's this moment where she comes downstairs outside of her New York City apartment and gives this sort of impromptu presser. And it's, it's all verite. It's unbelievable. And I think when we first, we didn't know about it. And when we first saw it, it sort of, I don't know if it really pivoted the storyline, but we certainly gave a lot of attention to it. And it was, a, it was certainly like, um, uh, it, it was a point where she was afraid that she was going to be killed. And she was really leaning on the press. And she said to the press, look, I lean on you. You know, I depend upon you, the press, um, for, my, for my safety. There was also another point where um, there was an interview um, where she talks about before California and after California, and we realized in the way that she was framing it that that was really a Rubicon for her, that that's how so she saw what happened to her. And we sort of start the film, you know, in the, in the what, what is the, the future, right, 70, 74, sort of looking back at what happened to her, trying to kind of untangle, you know, what, what happened? I, you know, I, I went to Washington this way, and this is what happened to me. Um, and, you know, it was sort of trying to untangle also the effect of gaslighting on her, you know, someone who is, you know, um, you know a higher power, which is essentially questioning her lived experience. So those were two examples. Thank you so much. Um, and going from a, you know, a documentary with a lot of historical footage, archival footage, uh, to Stranger at the Gate, which um, really told a story through interviews primarily, and I, I would love to hear about that. Why did you choose this method of hearing directly from, from Mac, um, from Mac's wife, uh, daughter, from the congregants of the Islamic Center? <laughs> well, yeah, so that we we didn't have any footage. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, we we're retelling a story that was not documented, and we had to figure out how do we do that. So we knew that we had these amazing, compelling subjects, and we set up the interviews. We did them all in the same room, which was the basement of the Islamic Center of Muncie. And we did that partly because we didn't have enough money to move, or we, we could shoot all the interviews quickly in one place and move people in and out, and the budget allowed for that amount of time. So we, um, we shot it that down there, and we, we had multiple cameras because we knew that we were gonna rely on these interviews to help tell the story. And we, um, we also, we, Connell and I both wore microphones when we did the interviews because we wanted not just their answers but sometimes our questions and then even sometimes the space in between the question and the answer because we, we were looking for moments that would reveal our characters, reveal truth about the story and we, um, so we really leaned into that interaction and those interactive moments. And there's a few spots in the film where we, we kept that because we felt like sometimes the, the question and the, the non-answer was more interesting than any words that the subject might say. Like Mac, we ask him one question, the first question we ask him, and he doesn't even answer it. But it's this, I love that moment because I feel like you learn a lot about him so um, the interviews, we're, we, we relied very heavily on them, but we also relied on um, <clears throat> aerial shots. Those were the, probably the two primary pieces that we used for visuals. And the thought behind that was a few things. One was um, this idea of surveillance, uh, sort of a military surveillance feel, because that's what the story's about. We also, um, 
were really interested in this idea of the eye of God. And, um, and then w the other thing about Ariel's was we didn't want to have any reenactments in the film. We wanted people to be able to imagine what happened instead of seeing what we imagined happened. And, um, and so the Ariel's sort of allowed for that space for the viewer to imagine what happened. So you, you're looking down and you, you're like, okay, it's, it's happening down there. I can't quite see what's happening, but I can imagine it. And in some ways, almost like when you're listening to the radio and you picture the visuals, we wanted that feeling in a cinematic way. And, uh, and so those were the building blocks of, of the film visually for us. Thank you so much for expanding on that, Joshua, um, and also to talk talking about the interviews because in a lot of doc documentary films there are talking head interviews, but it's not about relaying information or or even just relay you know telling that story, but the moments just capturing those interviews and seeing the subjects talk about their story is make is what really makes documentary films so powerful. And, and thank you so much for expanding on that so eloquently. Um, and so for Stranger the Gate, this is a story, as you mentioned, that takes place in Muncie, Indiana, um, about a former Marine who served in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, and the community of a local mosque and what happened when the two came together. Um, it's a very powerful story about spreading peace, about not making assumptions, and, and certainly about Islamophobia very, you know, very intricate, complex subjects. And really coming out of film, filming the story and, and hearing the story firsthand, were there any moments where you thought this could be expanded upon or used as a teaching tool or anything outside of the, the story itself that you were trying to tell? Um, yeah, we've been uh, approached to use the film as a teaching tool by uh, Facing History, and they have, um, they're connected to 140 teachers across the U.S., and so, 1,000, sorry, 140,000, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're speaking with them, and uh, going to get the film out through the, that curriculum, um, and then other organizations, too. Uh, we've been talking to veterans groups and stuff like that, so yeah. Yeah. I'll just add to that, that we, this film was part of a, a set of films that we've been making for the last uh, eight years. And uh, the set of films is called The Secret Life of Muslims. And the, the uh, concept was to tell stories about American Muslims that shatter stereotypes and build bridges. And uh, so this film is the 25th film that we've made on this subject matter. So the, in, the intention was, from the beginning was uh, purposeful to try to change hearts and minds. And, um, and so that, and that came out about because when I was growing up uh, as a boy in upstate New York, I faced a lot of anti-Semitism. And <clears throat> when I became a filmmaker, then 9-11 happened. And I saw my friends who were Muslim facing similar kind of hate and that's when we decided we wanted to do this, ser this series of films. Thank you for telling the story of Stranger at the Gate and, and really congratulations and thank you to everyone for the powerful, essential, important, captivating, beautiful stories uh, represented by all the filmmakers up here today. Um, so I, I want to you know, throw another general question out to the group, and I would love to start with uh, the Elephant Whisperers. You know, what advice uh, do you have regarding the creation of narratives around marginalized communities? If any. <laughs> sure, so I think, uh, um, there was a very conscious decision 
uh, that while we were filming this, that uh, the team took uh, was to not like have a voiceover, to let the community to have woman and belly talk for themselves, represent themselves. You know, a lot of people ask us, how can we help? What do they need? They actually don't need money. You know, they're self-sufficient. They and they're also giving a message of self-sufficiency through the film. Uh, in fact, it's really important for us to learn from them that uh, they take whatever they need from the village, from the from the jungle, but and that is enough for them. You know, so I think we there's so much deepened knowledge, there is so much history. Um, in fact, we have so much to learn from them than uh, the other way around. So we're happy to, uh, to, to be allowed to enter their world and to be able to tell their story in its truest form. I think that was our attempt, uh, to be fly on the wall and observe them, but rather than to lean in or impose anything or you know, try and s maybe get our ideas of, com you know, cities and how uh, how we are and how my, our mindset is. So in fact, we ended up learning a lot from them. So uh, while telling stories of marginalized community, I think allow them to speak for themselves. Yeah. I think when it comes to indigenous people, they very rarely had a voice. And uh, I think that was one thing that really wanted to focus on. And here we have Bowman and Belly, who, who come from the Katanaikin community. And there are only 1,700 of them left. And I think that was one of the things. And I think when we look at coexistence on this planet, we really have to go back to how indigenous communities have coexisted alongside with animals. And there's so much that we can learn from them. I think with mutual respect and cooperation, can we help save the planet? And I think we really need to go back and learn so much of the ancient knowledge instead of proceeding ahead with a lot of technology. Go back to the basics, look at how we thrive and how we share our space and what we're doing to other, uh, other beings on the planet. Great, thank you. Um, and Evgenia and Maxim, and this is a question, of course, that doesn't have to be specific to your films, but thinking about being a documentary filmmaker and just the, in general creating narratives around marginalized communities, if you have any thoughts about that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we're, besides this film, a whole out, we are also, um, do, as a photographer, I'm also a photographer, I've been doing a lot of stories on uh, indigenous communities in Siberia and in general in circumpolar wor world in the Arctic. I've worked for more than a decade and always following, like doing a long observation, following communities for a long time. Uh, I think the main thing um, for me was to, is to, well, first of all, I also cover our own community, which is, you know, native community of Siberia. And, and I think th th what, as filmmakers, as creatives, uh, f what is important for us is to not only tell the story, but um, try to translate the feel that people have towards the natural world and the pace and just the the way of being with animals. And I think that cinema is such a powerful language. We can actually do it. And um, without narration, without kind of maybe, uh, well, it, it, you know, in, in our case, without being, you know, planting like of certain seeds of thoughts, but just letting you um, see the place of these communities as it is, but try to, um, with artistic tools, really translate that love and that connection and through the sound, through the uh, photographs, through uh, th through moving image. I think that's, for, for us as filmmakers, that's the biggest challenge and that's the biggest excitement, actually, that we can do that. And uh, the more stories that will come out um, from these communities, from representatives of these communities that can channel that, that other way of being, that other way of seeing, uh, that other um, way of relating, 
um, I think that would be our world would become richer. Thank you. And uh, Jay, Joshua, Connell, and uh, Beth, if you would like to um, add to any of that, it, just the idea or the question of creating narratives around marginalized communities. I mean, I just, I, for me as a producer, I've really committed so much of my work to telling stories about women, by women. I feel that those stories are so important and have been overlooked for a long time. Um, there's so many chapters in our collective history that are told through a male lens, or we know the, the, the male experience, but we don't know women's experience, so... Um, I think it's really important that we tell all of these stories. Uh, our world is really rich. There are many experiences, many, point of, many points of view. Uh, so I just applaud all of this storytelling. And, and yeah, for me, I'm, I'm more invested in telling stories about women. Um, yeah, I mean, history is written by the victors, right? And it's these... Um, there's so many stories that are, are lost in the crevices. I mean, it was really important for us to, um, you know, sort of prioritize Martha's voice because her, um, her story had been lost to history, so we wanted to restore her agency, let her tell her story as much as possible. Um, so that really dictated our form, um, and I feel like there's so many other stories that are, that are, that are hidden, and... Um, you know, I, I, I'm excited for people to look back at history and, and, and really pull out these stories, not just women, but people of color, and, um, and like, let's, let's look back and see what there is to say. Thank you so much for contributing to that conversation. Um, I, we have time for one more question. So, and this is a, a general fun question. I, let's start with Joshua and Connell. Um, what other documentaries, films, uh, art, or other cultural materials have inspired your own work? Um, my all-time favorite film is American Movie, uh, which is a verite film uh, about filmmaking. Uh, and it's just so endearing and so intimate and so funny. Um, I recommend anybody watch it. I think it's only available on DVD now. but. Um, it's by Chris Smith, and uh, I love it. And it's, it, it plays a really fine balance in showing someone's life intimately and being able to laugh at it and love what they're going through at the same time. So, yeah, I love that one. I never knew that, because that's one of my favorite films. <laughs> no wonder we work so well together. <laughs> um, I really, I think that these films are really remarkable, and they're all so different, but... Um, I, I really am so blown away by this selection in this group of of people and what they've created. And so I enjoyed watching this program that I think you all just watched and uh, proud to be a part of it. And I, we're screening the short films again uh, after this panel as well. So for anyone who um, didn't have a chance to catch it beforehand, um, Please catch it now. Uh, but Anne and Beth, I would love to hear um, about what other films, art, cultural materials, really broad question have inspired your own work. Sure. I mean, I think we thought a lot about Senna when we were making this and inspired by that, that it's an all archival film. It's led by voiceover and, and it really you really get into the head of the protagonist. Um, so I, I personally was very inspired by that. I'm also going to say I've been very inspired by Jay Rosenblatt's films. I love all of his films. Um, it's all archival films, so you've been an idol and inspiration for me. Thank you. Uh, it's funny. This was, I hadn't made an archival film in a long time or worked on one. Uh, my heart has always sort of been with verite films, so mm, what comes to mind? When We Were Kings, um, films by the Maisels, 
by D.A. Pennebaker and Chris Hedgedith. Um, so anyway, hmm. <laughs> so uh, anyway, just, uh, you know, what's so great is you, when you get to work on a project and then you try to understand the world of that project and you watch all kinds of things and you read and you watch, you consume media, you listen to different music, so. Um, I think the Verite films have really inspired my career, but this project, I went to a lot of different places to find uh, inspiration to support the directorial team. Thank you. Jay? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I make different types of films, but one thing that um, I do a lot is make personal documentaries, this one being no exception. So in that realm, uh, the films of Alan Berliner, Ross McElwee are very influential. Uh, for this particular film, also uh, longitudinal films like Michael Apted's Seven Up series, um, you know, it is something that everyone goes back to when they see something that happens over time. Unfortunately, I, I would love to have had him in the audience, but he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, so I think mainly those come to mind for that question. Great, thank you. For, for me, the, it, when working in the Arctic, it was always very inspirational to read accounts of first explorers and, and um, but the people who are coming to explore and people who are there already meeting the explorers and just to understand what it feels like to be in such isolation. And so that was always inspirational. I think I've read <laughs> all the accounts of all explorers and mostly male, of course, but then there is also women and, 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 and it's a very different also views on, on, on exploration and, and solitude. Um, and in terms of films and not documentary, but if, uh, in terms of uh, aesthetics and just uh, um, the art of cin cinematography, of course, it's uh, uh, the great Russian director Tarkovsky, which has been always an inspiration for me. Well, for me, uh, the biggest inspiration come from our parents and uh, from especially from our father, because you know when we were kids, he always took us to the um, like. Uh, wildlife journeys and I remember this that how he, he gave us a love to the nature and that's inspiring us but as a cinematographer I really inspiring of um, uh, all Polish documentary films these compositions and the beauty of when that you see each um, shot as a, as, a, as, a, as a photo as a photography well I think for me a, a documentary is like Sea of Shadows, Viranga, Blackfish, all basically showed how, how animals are suffering. And I think that really inspired me to go after something that, was, that showed all the love and connection because I think we as humans are really making it very hard for animals to thrive on this planet. And, and I think that's what really inspired me to go ahead and move on to something to show the love and connection uh, that we share with this planet and other living creatures. I come, I come from fiction world. I have produced a bunch of uh, films from India that have traveled, given us a lot of love. And um, in the documentary world, I have just absolutely loved Amy. Uh, I, and the whole spectrum, I love Act of Killing. I mean, I think there is a rebel inside me which is so in awe of that. I know this is very different from what we have been on a journey on, but I want to say that the world of documentaries is uh, recent and is newer in India. Uh, I'm very inspired by the work of our executive producer and co-editor, Doug Blush, uh, and you know, being, being like a mentor and through his eyes also learning I've learned a lot on this journey, but my inspiration to go behind this story was my director, Kartiki, and her passion, uh, and her debut film that I wanted to make sure that I can provide 
a space for her to be able to do this in the purest form. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for sharing. It's, um, it's great to not only hear about the range of experiences and, and the range of different ways of telling stories about everything is really boils down to the individual story too, whether it's a global scale, a grand scale, an intimate, you know, one man in, in, a, in a hut in the middle of Siberia. Um, and thank you so much for making these powerful movies and thank you for continuing to make these powerful movies. We are in awe of all of our Academy Award nominees. Congratulations and thank you for taking the time to share more about your films with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.